But that process and how the Lord uh, confirmed it was really amazing. And I don't want to give anything away, but it's one of the moments where your mouth drops open and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, because it's, it's, just, uh, it's just such an amazing story. Alex, I have to tell you, thank you so, so much for being here, first of all, first of all. And I'm just going to like get this out of the way right from the beginning because I'm a big fan and just saying it if it's true. And that's, I'm a huge fan of yours, a huge fan of both of you and Steven, the movies. Facing the Giants, I think, was the first Christian movie I'd ever seen, if you can believe that. Wow. I know. And it was a sports movie, which is what, it was a football movie, which is what drew me in. That's like my genre. Um, and then from there, War Room and Overcomer. And really funny story about Overcomer, Justin and I, who's sitting right here, went to see it in the theater, came out blinking into like blinding daylight because we had just cried our eyes out in this dark theater. <laughs> and I said to him, I don't know how, but I am going to become friends with Alex and that woman with the glowy skin. I didn't even know her name at the point. <laughs> Sherry Rigby, ah. fast forward a few years ago, she's been on the show. Now I'm sitting down with you today and it's just like, what is life? So that's a long way of saying thank you for being here. Wow. That's very encouraging. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. So, I mean, um, the other spoiler alert that I think is also important to get out there is I got the huge honor to be one of the first people in the world to get to see this new film, Show Me the Father. And I watched it on my couch a couple of days ago and again, cried my eyes out through the whole thing. It's just, it's just beautiful. It's stunning visually. Justin and I were photographers for 15 years, so we appreciate that side of it. But it's also just this beautiful storytelling and this unfolding with some spoiler alerts I didn't see coming in a documentary. We won't give those away, but wow. Wow. So what was the heart? Why did you guys feel like now is the time for our first documentary and we want it to be about fatherhood? You know, everybody has a fatherhood story, and, and some fatherhood stories will make you cry out of uh, grief or pain, and others make you cry because you're so grateful for um, a, a good dad presence in your life. And so there's all different kinds of stories. For this particular movie, we just had a burden to connect the, the, the role of father to who God is. You know, mm -hmm. he's the only perfect father. So we do so by coming from five different vantage points. In Show Me the Father, we tell stories where maybe a father wasn't present at all. Another story where a father was a, a terrible influence on his children and caused some pain there. Uh, another where a father was good. And um, <clears throat> so we, we wanted people to relate to one or more of those circumstances. And these stories, when we were interviewing people, some of the twists we were not ready for. Mm. And so uh, they were just so jarring as you've seen it now. Yeah. And there's a couple of twists that just make you gasp. Yeah. And um, and so we said, we've got to present these stories. And so it's our first documentary. But it and, I, and I, now that you've seen it, you'll know what I mean by this. It has all of the heart, emotion and surprise ending of a feature film. That's right. 100%. So, so we are thrilled to put it out. I, it comes out uh, September 10th in theaters. And and so uh, I can't wait for people to see it and see what God does with it. Yeah, I love it. So one of the things I noticed about your movies, even before I got to watch this one or before we even got the, the press kit for this one, I had noticed that you tell stories about fatherhood, right? In Facing the Giants, it's a journey to try to become a father. In War Room, it's what happens when the father of the family goes down a wrong path. And an overcomer, it's a, a father who was absent, who's suddenly back in the daughter's life. And so I wanted to know, um, did you did you realize that ahead of time? Or just, was it something you kind of noticed looking backwards? Like, wow, fatherhood is really a theme that speaks to us. Well, both my, my older brother, younger brother, all of us have six or seven kids. My yeah. oldest brother, seven. And my younger brother and I have six. We have 19 kids between us. At the same time, we have a father who himself had a hard upbringing. And when he was in his 20s, he said, 
to God, Lord, I don't want this stuff to continue mm-hmm. in my family line anymore. The uh, stress, the the desperation, the uh, addictions that were uh, present in, in our family line. And he said, would you help me break this chain and start a new chain of healthy habits of of love, of being present for my family. So that's what my dad did. Mm. So by the time that we came along, there was no alcohol, drugs, pornography, infidelity in my family that had been in my family line in generations before. And so his impact on us growing up was uh, so powerful, especially when we learned our family's history. And so we, we are drawn to stories, especially that have a strong father figure. Yeah. Because of what we've gone through. But at the same time, we we see God the Father as the only ever perfect example of a father. And so if we can point people to faith in, in the Lord through Jesus Christ, that's exactly what we'll do. Yeah. You say in the film, uh, I can't remember if it was you or Stephen who said it, but you say that in every movie you make, there is a representation of your dad, Larry. And there are a few um, quick scenes that show that. Could you walk us through a few of the, of the different like Easter egg places you've put your dad? Our first small film was called Flywheel. And there is a man that walks with a cane. And when at the time we were making that movie, our father was walking with the cane. Our father has multiple sclerosis. Mm-hmm. And but he has not allowed that to stop him from honoring the Lord, praying for people, supporting us. And so even though he's in a wheelchair or a hospital bed, uh, he can still pray, encourage, learn, teach, bless. He does all of those things. Mm. And so um, that's made such a difference in our life. So at the time we made Flywheel, the father figure in that in that movie is um, really a reflection of our dad. And Facing the Giants, the father's in a wheelchair. At the time we made that movie, our father was in a wheelchair. Mm. And uh, if you move forward, even all the way to Overcomer, where the father figure in that movie is in a hospital bed. Our father is now in a hospital bed. Wow. But um, but the way he pours into our lives and loves on us and prays for us. So, yeah, our dad definitely has influenced and, um, and, and, and brought a perspective to each of our movies uh, because of his influence in our lives. But we want to say to every dad out there, it is never too late to start a new line, to start a new chain of events, a chain of blessings, a chain of forgiveness, a chain of growth in your family. You you may be 60 years old, 70 years old, and you can still go to God the Father Mm -hmm. and say, help me forgive, help me ask for forgiveness, help me start a new line of blessings. And that makes all the difference in your offspring's lives. Yeah. And so uh, we have seen that firsthand. Mm, I love that. Um, you mentioned already that your dad was, he had a very different upbringing than you did. And it was his determination that he was going to break this, these family chains. And I feel like something that's also important for us to talk about as we're digging into this is there's probably not a parent listening right now who doesn't feel like they get it wrong, who doesn't feel like they're, they're messing up. And, and you talk about this concept of father wounds in the film, and, and there can be really, really deep gaping wounds, or it can be just like little scratches. But I guess I just, I would like you to talk a little bit about, you know, when your dad first got that diagnosis, he talks about in the film, he went to a dark place. And you guys say you didn't really know it because he hit it well. Was there anything from that time that even as an um, as amazing of a dad he was, there were still just these things that you guys had to work through from that time? My father, though he became a Christian in his teenage years, um, he grew up with a lot of um, fear. He did not feel like he was loved. He did not feel accepted. <clears throat> you know, he did not um, have a lot of confidence and so, and he struggled with who God was mm-hmm. because his initial concept of God the Father came from what his earthly father was like. Mm-hmm. And and during my dad's upbringing, his earthly father was not very present in his life. He was an alcoholic. He was sometimes gone for days at a time. He didn't know where he was. Um, he was uh, an angry man. And so that played a part in my dad's upbringing, thinking I'm not good enough. I'm lo- not loved enough. I'm, I'm scared of my dad. And so when he thought, what what would God be like? He attributed those attributes to God. Yeah. 
He said, God must also be distant and angry with me. God must not love me very much either. Mm -hmm. And so when my grandfather did become a Christian late in his life, and, and he told my father, I'm sorry for, for the way I was. I'm sorry for not telling you I loved you, for not being there for you. Though it did help, my dad still had to overcome his fears and insecurities from his upbringing. Well, he overcame those through a faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, and it didn't heal overnight. It took a while. But um, he is such a strong man now, even mm -hmm. in, in his hospital such a strong man of faith and encouragement and joy. And so I want those attributes in my life. I want that faith, encouragement, and joy. So my dad did bless us growing up, did tell us he loved us, did support us, did pray for us, did lead our family spiritually. And so um, that that chain of events was altered because of my father's yeah. faith. He said none of the generations is going to continue. So is, you know, it's not that it's easy. It is hard to make that turn, but it is possible. Yeah. I love that. There's a part where Dr. Tony Evans, who's in the film talks about earthly fathers are meant to be an introduction to and a reflection of God. And he says, the problem is that earthly fathers sometimes crack the mirror so that that reflection doesn't come through clearly. And, yes. you know, talking about these father wounds, talking, there's, there are people listening right now who think, you know, if, if, if a father is an example of God, like, I don't want, I don't want that in my life. Right. I've, I've been hurt enough. And so the deep philosophical theological question I had when I was watching the film is why do you think God had earthly fathers at all? Like there's a part in the film where it talks about how many of the heartbreaks in society could be fixed if we could get fathers to step up and, and heal at the family level. And so I'm thinking to myself, oh gosh, God, why didn't you just skip that step? Why weren't you, why didn't we just have one father and it's you, you know, like why, why do we have this earthly version that can has, runs the risk of getting it wrong? And I think you could fill in that blank for any human relationship really. But do you have any thoughts on that? Like, like did God just need us to have an introduction first or just as a foil to like what his love looks like? What are your thoughts on, on that big, deep question? <laughs> well, it, you know, it's interesting. Even before the world was created, there was God, the father, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and he was there. He is, he is uh, there from the beginning scripture says. And, um, uh, and so when he created the structure of family and he gave us a father, we are meant, and I am a, I'm a father of six kids, we are meant to reflect the love of God the Father. But we don't do that perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, and so our kids look at us and they get their first sense of what God is like based on what kind of father we are. But we will never be a perfect example of God the Father because he's perfect, we're not. But let me give you a, a, an analogy. My son, youngest son, plays basketball. He was on a team where the coach was a yeller. Mm -hmm. he, he, would, he would yell and yell and get mad at the boys for not running the right play or doing things. And so sometimes he would get angry. Not only in the game. You know, he wasn't generally an angry person, but he was very expressive during the game. And sometimes he would yell at my son. Well, when my son grew to another level of play and got a new coach, he, of course, expected that coach to yell at him, mm -hmm. to get angry when plays weren't done the right way or passes were missed or things like that. When that coach didn't do that and he was more affirming and encouraging, it kind of caught him off guard. He was like, wait a minute, I thought coaches yell. Mm -hmm. Well, why did you think that? Because his original coach did yell. And so we get our concept of God from our first experience with our dad. But what I would tell everybody out there, whether you had a good father or not, God is a perfect father. Mm -hmm. All of those attributes, yes, he is a God of justice. Yes, he is the judge, but he is also the, he's full of mercy. He's full of grace. He's full of love. He's full of kindness and patience. And he wants you to know those attributes from him. Yeah. He's also a gentleman. He's not going to barge in your life. You know, he wants to invite you into a relationship with him. And I think when people discover that God is the perfect father, even if they had a poor dad on earth and they begin to differentiate between the two, they will put more trust in the Lord. But 
your father is never going to, your earthly father is never going to be a perfect example and reflection of who God is. God is perfect. We are not. Mm, yeah. Let's let's talk about some of the stats you guys share in the movie. Um, some of them that I'd never heard before. We're sort of talking about kids who grew up in fatherless homes. If you, I have them written down here, but do you remember, remember any of those off the top of your head? Some of those stats that are just shocking. Yeah, I, I know that uh, it, it's the high percentage of 70 to 90 percent of kids that don't have fathers in the home are more likely to end up in jail, more likely to use drugs, more likely to have unplanned pregnancies, more likely to run away from home. You know, it's crazy percentages and they're all very high. And uh, though I can't, you know, it may be 88, 92, I can't I don't re- recall the exact percentages, but I know they're ridiculously high and, yeah. and it's heartbreaking because when they don't have that stability at home, when they don't have that guidance at home, they will look for it somewhere. Yeah. It, there's an old saying that even a rose will get uh, water from a sewer if there's no other option, yeah. right? Mm. And so, uh, so it's for us, and I'm a dad, um, first to know God the Father, but secondly, to be very intentional about how we love our kids, how we invest in our kids, to be present for your kids, to, to be a stabilizing factor and know you're never going to be a perfect parent, but to love them and to let them know, I know I'm not a perfect parent, but I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm grateful God gave you to me as my child. I would never trade you with anybody else. And for them to grow up knowing that they're loved in that regard. Wow. What a difference that makes. Yeah. I love that. I'm just going to read a couple of the stats that were most shocking to me. 90% of homeless or runaways are from fatherless homes. Uh, 63% of youth suicides, 71% of pregnant teens, 85% of youth in prison, 14 times more likely to, uh, sorry, four times more likely to end up in poverty, 10 times more likely to use drugs, 32 times more likely to run away. It's, it's just crazy. And there's something you said about the, the rose and the sewer that reminds me of a quote from Jim Daly in the film. He says, with an alcoholic father, talking about his dad, you never know if you're going to get Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde, but I was so desperate for a father, I was willing to take either. That's so That's right. so heartbreaking. Tell us a little bit about um, Jim's story and, and why you wanted to include him in particular. So Jim Daly today is the president of Focus on the Family. That is a worldwide ministry that uh, really touches lives all over the globe. And his story, when he was growing up, Uh, His father was not a good father. He would be present in his life for short amounts of time, but he was an alcoholic and then he'd be gone for long amounts of time. So Jim grew up feeling like he never really had a father or at least a good father at any point in his upbringing. And of course, that caused a lot of uh, emotional scarring in his own life, you know, being struggling with who he was, whether he was valued, loved. Uh, you know, is life worth living at all if my dad doesn't care for me and love me? And so um, when he his father finally came back and he had a, a little bit of a rough relationship with him, um, his, his extended family, he was still fairly young. His extended family said, you don't need to be living with him. He's an alcoholic. He could turn abusive at any time. And so he told his dad, I don't want to live with you anymore. Uh, And this was during a brief period where they were in the home together. He said, I don't want to live with you. I'm going to go live with my older brother. Uh, He doesn't want anything to do with you. And so the dad admitted, I know I'm not a good father. And and that was the last interaction they had. And then his father ended up uh, passing away. He Mm -hmm. had gotten drunk and gotten a bad circumstance and died. And um, and so Jim Daly grieves that his last conversation with his father was a very negative one. And so as he grew and he eventually became a Christian and he had a coach in his life, a football coach that was kind of like a father figure, Mm -hmm. that football coach poured into him, really invested time and love and called the man out in him and helped him step into manhood. And so uh, Jim Daly, you know, reflects on that in this movie. But here was the kicker. And and this was so moving to me. Uh, Jim says, But when I reflect back, having that coach in my life, being told that I was loved, becoming a Christian, finding a good wife, having my children, being a part of a ministry, once I connected to God the Father, he was the perfect father to me. Mm. And it's not that your problems go away, 
But I now had a father watching over me, loving me, uh, you know, protecting me there when I had issues that I could go to and, and, and pray to or even vent to. And he said, God became my father. Mm. And that, that, is a, that is something that we, we all need to get to that place. Mm. No matter what kind of dad you have, that you turn to God the father who is the perfect father and loves you more than you will ever know. Yeah. You know, that um, that part where Jim talks about he still grieves and regrets to this day that his last words to his dad were basically saying, you were not a good dad, you were not a good father. And that brought up questions for me. When we're thinking about being these people who break generational chains um, and who, who do have a chance to have the hard conversations, as long as there's still time, um, you know, there's, there's a part in my book, Dirt, where I say to my mom, I'm still here and you're still here and we're still family and there's still time for, you know, there's still time for us essentially. Um, in the balance of having those tough generational changing conversations, what is that line we walk between honoring a father and a mother and telling the truth about what was lacking or what needs to change? You know, those are, those are kind of like both of those are in the top 10, right? Like how do we kind of balance those two um, when we, when we are having those tough conversations? Cause there is still time. There is a formula that when we figure out is the greatest formula ever, and that is that truth and love must go together. Mm. You know, when someone gives me a hard truth that I don't like, but I know they love me, I am more apt to accept it, to process it, and to apply it to my life. Yeah. When someone gives me a truth and I know they don't love me, don't care about me, Generally, I reject it. Mm. And, and I'm not saying that's OK. I'm just saying that's my tendency. And so uh, when I have a friend who I know loves me and he, and he says, Alex, you can do better in this area or whatever, uh, I listen to him. Well, that transfers to me being a dad to my kids when my kids know that I love them. And I have to correct them or, or discipline them in some way. They are more apt to receive it. It's those you know, we, we often talk about rebellious teenagers. When a rebellious teenager thinks that their friends love them more than their parents do, they listen to their friends mm. and they reject their parents. And then the parents get angry because the parents may be telling them something that's true and right, but the kids are rejecting it. Well, they don't truly believe that their parents love them. They may feel like my parents are always harping on me, just trying to change me or whatever. So it's important for parents to demonstrate love to your children, because if they know you love them, they will listen to you. Mm -hmm. If they question whether you love them, they may not. Now, here, now here's the reverse. If you have been hurt by your parent and they weren't a good mama, good dad, and you have emotional scars, if you come to them respectfully and lovingly, and, and walk through those hurts, they are more likely to listen and to process it. Yeah. If they feel like you're just venting, arguing, blaming them, they're more likely to reject it, even if you're right. Mm. So you have to remember that truth and love go together. That, yeah. That's what makes them so effective. Mm. When you present truth to somebody, if it's accompanied by love, you know, that we used to say a spoonful of sugar ha helps mm -hmm. the medicine go down. That's right. So, uh, yeah. So do, do you ever confront your mom and dad about wrongs? Yes, you do. But you have to do it with respect and love. Mm. And if they sense that, they are more likely to receive the hard part. Yeah, I love that. And that actually that conversation leads into another question that I had thinking about, you know, everybody listening right now, there's a good chance by and large, this is a, a female audience that I have here. Um, and I'm wondering what the research has said to you about the, the role of the mother, right? The, the importance of mothers also stepping up. Was there equal amounts of data? Was there still something that pushed you to want to talk to the fatherhood side of it? Like what, where do the moms fit into all this? So as you know, uh, all of us have a part of our heart that needs a dad and needs a mom. Mm -hmm. And the way God's wired us, we approach things usually from two completely different perspectives. And uh, sometimes it's the mind I'm thinking about truth. And so I'm just going to blurt that out. Sometimes it's our will. This is what I want to happen. Sometimes it's our emotions. I'm just blurting something out because it's the way I feel. 
Well, normally when you have a mom and, and your dad, you have different aspects of those, mind, will, and emotion. <laughs> and it's almost never the same. But as you know, sometimes we're moved to take action because of emotion. Mm -hmm. We see how it's impacting one of our parents or one of our siblings or one of our children. And so sometimes it's I'm just making a determination mentally or by my will that I'm going to do something. Say mm -hmm. a New Year's resolution. My will says I'm going to do this. But your emotions like, no, I really don't want to do this. You know, <laughs> but so, so to have a mom and a dad present in the home, you get a better balance of those perspectives and those things. Mm -hmm. You get the nurture of emotion, you get the nurture of the will and a nurture of uh, the mind um, using logic and things like that. And there's a better balance when a mom and dad are both there. Now, if there's not a mom and dad there, it doesn't mean it can't happen. It does mean it's going to be harder. Mm -hmm. But but absolutely for, for men and women, to invest in their kids, to be there and to love. God has designed this. It, you know, it's almost like ketchup and mustard, salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. They're best when they're together. And so um, we do focus on the fatherhood of God in this movie. But for every woman that watches this film, she, I mean, they have fatherhood stories too. Everybody yeah. has a dad, yeah. either present or not present. And for you to be in your home and to recognize your husband may have wounded your children mm -hmm. or your husband may have been wounded himself and to go to him with truth and love. Remember, don't leave out that love. Don't just throw truth at him yeah. uh, to go to him to truth and love and say, can I talk to you? Mm -hmm. uh, there's something I think we need to work through um, so it doesn't fester. So it doesn't repeat itself in the next generation. Can we talk about this? When, when those emotions are there, feelings as well as the mind and the will, uh, you're in a better scenario. So mm. uh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I love that. that. Having a mom and dad there together is just better. Mm, love that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the flip side. You know, one of the stories in the movie that's a really good example of a dad pouring into his son. And um, it's it's Sherman Smith when he's talking about his dad and he says, you know, Seattle Seahawks coach, he says, my dad would tell me, don't buy the lie that this is all you're capable of. He was telling me, this was a line I wrote down and like underlined like seven times. My identity was supposed to impact my behavior. Tell, me, right. what, tell me about that line. Tell me what you're, what you take from that line. Cause man, that was good. So you know, if I am uh, capable of singing and playing the piano uh, and I never do it, that's just sad, mm -hmm. right? If you are capable of uh, investing in someone's life and you see the need, you know how to do it and you don't do it, that's just sad. So, um, you know, he was talking about the fact that he was loved by his parents. He, ha he was academically smart. He was capable of so much. So do not buy the lie that culture is saying that you're limited and you can only do a little bit. Mm -hmm. His dad was saying, um, first of all, you are a loved son. You are a capable son. You have people that are rooting for you, cheering for you, supporting you, walking with you. So you have all the potential in the world. So don't buy the lie that you can't do something. Well, that's such a great thing for a parent to say to their kid anyway. Um, but secondly, once you have your identity in Christ, once you recognize I am a loved, saved, redeemed, forgiven child of God, then I'm not going to buy the lie that I'm worthless or incapable or a failure or unloved. I'm not buying that lie. Mm -hmm. So my identity in Christ now should impact my behavior. For example, um, I am a Christian and God has wired me to tell stories. Um, I love true stories. I love telling stories of inspiration and hope. And so I'm not buying the lie that I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not buying the lie that, um, you know, because of my looks or age or, or where I live or, or background that I can't do that. Uh, you know, when the Lord's wired me to do that and because I know who I am in Christ, I go for it and the Lord has blessed that. Mm -hmm. So because of who I am in Christ. So when you are in Christ, you have a brand new identity as Sherman did. Mm -hmm. He got saved and had a brand new identity. So he has one identity as his father's beloved son. He has another identity as a, a child of God. And so his dad introduced him to both of those. So he said, whatever culture is telling you, don't buy that lie. Yeah. 
And so, uh, and he didn't. Mm, I love that. Uh, let's talk a, like one step beyond that. And this is something that I have walked through as an adult is that balance of a parent saying to you, you can go do anything you want to do. You're going to get out. You're going to be the one to leave, which was my dad saying that to me. Um, and, and the message that also needs to be delivered hand in hand with that, you know, like, like we've been talking about truth and love, um, that also makes clear and makes sure that the kid knows, yes, you can go do anything if that's God's will for you. But if you don't do these things, you're still loved, right? Because for me, getting out, achieving A pluses, gold stars became my worth for a long time. You know, um, performance is important second to who we are and to know that we're loved by God. So um, should we do good things? Yeah, you should, because there's a lot of benefits and there's and there are there are blessings that come from that. But uh, what I do is not the primary um, de- determining factor of who I am. It is a reflection, but it's not the primary determining factor. So look, I- I'll say it this way. I make films for a living. I'm a filmmaker, but I'm first and foremost a child of God. Mm -hmm. If I never make another film, I'm still a child of God. If I never make another film, God still loves me. He still forgives me. He still, now, can I do good if I make films? Sure, I can. Some good things can happen. I can bless a lot of people, help a lot of people if I make those films. But making the films is not the foundation of who I am. Mm -hmm. If I had to build a a, a pyramid, my foundation is that I'm a child of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. That is my foundation. God doesn't change. That he is the perfect anchor for who I am. You know, he doesn't shift with the wind. So my foundation, my identity is in Christ. Then I am a husband to my wife. Mm -hmm. Then I am a father to my kids. Then I am a filmmaker. So if you knock off the top block and I don't make any films anymore, my foundation is still set. Yeah. I still know who I am. We get in trouble when we invert that and our foundation is my job or the money I make or the house I live in. Because if those things are then removed, everything else topples. Yeah. Right. So when it comes to who I am and the value that I get, it's first and foremost in the one who created me. Uh, so my, my identity is in Jesus Christ. That's where I get my value. And then what I do is built on top of that. Yeah. So if I, like my dad has him as he's in a hospital bed. He can no longer walk around and be a minister or a preacher or, you know, lead a school, but he can pray. Mm-hmm. He can read. He can bless. He can encourage from his hospital bed. So his identity is still intact. Yeah. You, there's a line in the film where we talk about functional orphans. They don't know that there's a God and that his plans for him, for them, are good. And so it was really important for you guys to also share an adoption story in the film, which also has a really interesting plot twist uh, or, or like reveal aha moments, which I will not give away. Um, but tell us a little bit about Stephen um in particular, and you guys in particular wanted to tell Mia's story? Well, as I said earlier, the three Kendrick brothers, of whom I'm the middle, we all have six kids. My older brother has seven kids. Um, and, and the Lord put it on my younger brother's heart to adopt. Mm. And and the Lord, you know, we knew, they knew it was the Lord because the Lord was telling the wife and the husband the same thing separately. Mm. At the same time. So when they came together, uh, they were like, wow, the Lord's had that on my heart, too. And so that you, they, so they knew the Lord was stirring their hearts. They ended up adopting a child from China. And, and for anybody that has been through the adoption process, that can be a roller coaster mm-hmm. because um, you're wondering, is this the right child for us? You know, um, you, you're, you're trying to do your homework and, and your research. And at the same time, you want you want, you know, there's no perfect kid out there. So you want to be good parents to this adopted child. So they went through the process of adopting a little girl from China. But that process and how the Lord uh, confirmed it was really amazing. And I don't want to give anything away, yeah. but it's one of the moments where your mouth drops open and you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, because it's it's just, uh, it's just such an amazing story. But my, my, uh, but Stephen, you know, we were talking about identity earlier, 
you know, once he adopted his daughter Mia from a orphanage in China, you know, they went over there and she was already two years old. She didn't have anything. Hmm. She, and, and she, you know, uh, when she when she cried leaving the orphanage because she didn't know where she was going, Stephen says in the documentary, and I'll just share this part of it. He said it's interesting that once the papers were signed, and Mia was now ours, mm. and I'm holding this little two, or maybe maybe she was three at the time. I'm holding my daughter. She's on a plane. She's never been on a plane. She's with two people from America, really not familiar with who they are, doesn't know that she's now in the Kendrick family, doesn't know that she's going to have brothers and sisters who love her, doesn't know she's going to have a home and provision and food and clothes and all this provided for her. So she doesn't yet know who she is, Mm. right? Yeah. Even though she is legally and officially Mia Kendrick, Mm. right? Chinese girl with an American name that's now being raised in an American family. But she didn't understand all that. And Stephen correlates that to the fact that when we understand who we are in Christ, when we understand that there is a God who loves us, wants to watch over us, walk with us, care for us, teach us, you know, then it changes our perspective. Yeah. And he said, so adopting his daughter, Mia, and again, there's some twists in there that I don't want to reveal. Adopting his daughter, Mia, gave him new insight into God pulling us into his family mm. and calling his children when we are in Jesus Christ. And so just a beautiful picture of adoption and of fatherhood. And I can't wait for people to see the whole story. Yeah. We'll just say God is in the details. He's yes. In the details. There's a, a line from Stephen I wanted to share in the episode. He says, just because Jesus is your Lord, it doesn't mean you are relating well to God as your father. If you're not believing he's going to answer your prayers, that he loves you, that his heart is for you, then you need to start relating to God as a father and ask God to reveal to your heart who he is and how he wants to relate to you. And so last big question is for the woman who is listening right now and she really is in the thick of those father wounds or, or a story that's repeating generation to generation. And she, she feels like, you know, I don't at this moment have a lot of hope for my earthly father to fill that role. And I want to know what it looks like for God to fill that role. I was wondering if you would actually pray for her um, and, and tell her what you want her to know. This is what I would say. As we've said earlier in this broadcast, your dad is not a reflection of how God is. God has the mercy, the the desire for a relationship with you, the love, the encouragement, the presence that your earthly father did not give you. And so don't hold up your earthly father's attributes and look at God and think he's the same way. He's not the same way. You know, your, your earthly father may have failed you. God will not. But he wants a relationship with you, and he's not going to force that on you. Yeah. And so you can go to God and say, um, through Jesus Christ. And by the way, Jesus Christ is the portal. Jesus Christ is the one who who affords us and, gain, and gives us opportunity. It's like Jesus came and paid the penalty for all of our sins so that we can have a right relationship with God the Father. So first I would say, go to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? Uh, You are God's son. You died on the cross for me. And Lord, I ask you to uh, be my Lord and Savior and introduce me to God the Father. And so, uh, and then when you do that, God will have a relationship with you. So let me pray that right now. And if you want to, you can can pray what I'm about to pray, and then I'm going to pray for you. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me for my sin? I know sometimes I can be selfish. I know that there are things I've done that are wrong, and you know what those are, God. Would you first forgive me? Secondly, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you are God's son, that you died, and Scripture says you you were buried and rose again three days later. And now that you are sitting at the right hand of God, and you are the interceder, you're the one that intercedes between me and God that I can have a right relationship with him. But God loves me. Help me to walk in that love. Help me to see God for who he is, that he is a loving father. Help me to to separate my fa- my earthly father's attributes from God's attributes and not blame God for things that my dad may have done. 
But secondly, would you fill my heart with such love that I'm able to forgive my dad for any hurts that he caused me, wrongs, uh, things that he said, times he should have been there that he wasn't, or just anything that he did that hurt me? Would you help me to forgive him as I, as you have forgiven me of my sins? And secondly, to pray for him that you would, um, if he's alive, that you would stir his heart to have a right relationship with you, that you would begin healing what no man can heal and only God can heal. Would you begin healing my heart? And would you fill my heart with your love where I know that you love me and that you're there for me and help me begin an ongoing relationship with you, walking with you daily. And I ask this of you, God, in, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm, that was good. Can you come on every day and do prayers for us? That would be amazing. <laughs> all right. Well, Alex, I, I, I hate to see this come to an end because I could talk to you all day, but I understand that we've got this movie coming out. We've got another movie coming out a month later that we want yeah, you to yeah. tell everybody about, uh, where they can see both of these, where they can get more information about them, where they can follow you and Steven and, and all the crew and just tell us all the things. Sure. So on September the 10th, we have a, a movie coming out called Show Me the Father. It's the documentary we, we've been referring to. You're going to laugh. You're going to cry. You're going to love this movie. And it's going to help you. It's going to encourage you mm -hmm. no matter what circumstance you came from. Yeah. So that's called Show Me the Father. You can go to showmethefathermovie.com for more information. So again, that comes out September 10th. Later in October, on October 15th, that's October 15th, Courageous Legacy is coming out. We released a movie some years ago called Courageous. Mm -hmm. And what we've done, we've gone back, is about 10 years ago, we've gone back, we've re-edited the movie, added new shots, new scenes, and a brand new ending. This is why mm -hmm. that's significant. This new ending, you will literally see the actors age 10 years, for real, mm -hmm. age 10 years, and you see where their characters and their families ended up. I've never seen a movie do this before. Hmm. And so we're excited about this. So Courageous Legacy comes out in theaters on October 15th. You can go to CourageousTheMovie.com. Again, CourageousTheMovie.com to see uh, clips and to get information. But we're excited about these movies. These movies have uh, all the emotion and surprise endings and action that you would want in films. and But they'll also bless you and help you. And so Show Me the Father is September 10th. Courageous Legacy is October 15th. And we hope that you can see them. Can't wait to show them to you. Amazing. And where can they follow you, find you on Instagram? Sure. The.alex.kendrick is on Instagram, the Alex Kendrick. And then uh, you can find me on Facebook as well if you look up Alex Kendrick. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and then uh, if, you, if you follow me, you'll see family shots and family adventures that we go on and things like that. So you may get a kick out of that stuff. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you're welcome to follow me. Yeah, love it. All right, friends, the film is Show Me the Father. It releases nationwide on September 10th. Grab your kids, grab your parents, grab your whole family and watch this stunning story. The stunning five stories unfold together. But don't say I didn't warn you. Make sure you bring the tissues. Believe me firsthand. Yeah. And a huge, huge thanks to Alex Kendrick for joining me today and making me continue to ask, how do I get to call this my job? Until next time, friends, this is The Mary Morant Show. Yeah.